Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and always may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the book of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, fly away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son. I am a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. The word of the Lord. 
Let us say together Psalm 82 on page 5. God takes his stand in council of heaven. He gives judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? Show fear. As weak in the orphan, defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods. And are your children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals. And all Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations to your own. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In your prayers, in our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Ephesus, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be fulfilled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him as, your fruit, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord.
Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. Biff beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, Levi, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. When he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on him. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Behold, a white, upper-middle-class Protestant was driving through an inner-city neighborhood on a Sunday morning, en route to his beautiful, well-endowed downtown church when his Lexus broke down. He was then attacked and robbed by some drug addicts who then vandalized his car and left him half dead. Now, a black minister happened by on his way to church but didn't want to get involved and did not want to be accused of being an Uncle Tom and so pretended that he didn't see. And a black singer came by, but he was already late for his church choir rehearsal, so he could not in good conscience keep the people waiting at the church any longer. He hesitated, but then he went on. But it so happened that a black Muslim and one time Black Panther came by saw the white, upper-middle-class Protestant, sprayed antiseptic and put makeshift bandages on his wounds, loaded him into his car, and took him to the hospital. Now, who in this case was the neighbor? And who was being neighborly? Or consider another translation. Behold, A certain black middle-class Pentecostal was driving through a sketchy, working-class white neighborhood when his Chevy broke down. He was then attacked by some skinhead hoodlums who robbed him and beat him and left him half dead in the gutter. Now, by chance, a well-dressed Republican businessman passed by on his way to Rotary, a most solemn assembly, where a speech on community betterment was to be heard. He was already late, already in danger of not fulfilling his attendance quota. He really could not risk stopping. And so he pretended not to notice and continued on his way. 
Then, a Natalie attired Democratic businessman passed by on his way to a Lions Club meeting, also a rather solemn assembly, where he was to be the tail twister. Since this was his first time in that honorable position, and since he was already late, he felt that he could not stop. He did, however, give a moment's serious consideration to calling Washington to see if there might be something they could do to help this poor fellow. But alas, he left his cell phone at home, and so he continued on to his meeting. But after that, there journeyed by a blue-collar, independent, Polish-Italian, Roman Catholic factory worker on his way to the tavern. And seeing the beaten, wounded, black, middle-class Pentecostal in the gutter, he stopped his old pickup truck, administered first aid, called 911, and followed the ambulance to the hospital, where the blue-collar, independent, Polish-Italian factory worker paid for the black, middle-class Pentecostal's room and care in advance. Now, who was the neighbor? And who was being neighborly? Where do you see yourself in this story of the good Samaritan, the good neighbor? Asking people to personally identify with the story of the Good Samaritan is a, well, a little like asking all the children of a Little League baseball team what position they would like to play. Just as surely as you're going to end up with nine pitchers, you'll find yourself with a congregation full of hypothetical Samaritans. We tend to think of ourselves, depending on how we're feeling on a particular day, as either the priest Levite or the Good Samaritan. And so, it's a little wonder that the story of the Good Samaritan is both well-loved and completely misunderstood. The Samaritan, as the one who is in control of his own life, wealth, and well-being, is actually the incarnation of all of our self-oriented little dreams. Under our shallow perception of the Samaritan's actions, we find comfort in seeing ourselves as willing to help others, offering aid and comfort to those in need. But Arthur McGill, a professor at Harvard Divinity School back in the 1970s, proposed an idea that smashes this illusion. In the Good Samaritan story in today's Gospel, we are not the Samaritan, nor are we the priest or the Levite. Rather, we are the anonymous, beaten, bloodied nobody lying helpless in the ditch. We are the needy, not the helper. At the conclusion of his Good Samaritan story, Jesus asks the lawyer, which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer is being asked by Jesus to identify his neighbor. And the answer, of course, is the Samaritan. But the lawyer, the one seeking the way to eternal life, is the wounded man in the story, the one who receives aid from his Samaritan neighbor. And so it is with us. Arthur McGill believed that many of us are caught up in a destructive bronze people myth, living out a bronze dream. Bronze here serves as his image for people so clean, so neat, so tanned, so buoyant and assured that any trace of the frailties that are a part of humans' life, suffering, fear, death, seem 
not to touch them in any way. The overriding ethic keeping us bronze people alive is an ethic of success or avoidance. A falsely gleaming notion of bronze love is largely responsible for our notion that we are the good Samaritan, or at least the priest or the Levite. In the neat and tidy world of the bronze dream, Love is a well-ordered, one-way street. Bronze churches speak of love as helping others, but they ignore what helping others does to the person who loves. They ignore the fact that love is self-expenditure, a real expending, a real losing, a real deterioration of the self. In other words, love costs. This is why we must begin by seeing ourselves as the wounded man. For all of us are incapable of truly being the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, in fact, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus' entire existence was centered about bringing this kind of selfless, self-expending love into the world and into our lives. Jesus is our good Samaritan who picks us up, heals our wounds, and provides for all of our needs. Yet Jesus does even more. He incarnated love so perfectly that he not only healed us, he died for us. While Arthur McGill's bronze people are busy stockpiling and safeguarding their sense of self with possessions and the illusions of control, Jesus engenders true life, true love, true identity by giving up all that he has even his life, in order to save us, even though we don't deserve it. There is a story about a man who fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out of it. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person came along and said, it's logical that someone would fall down there. Pharisee said, only bad people fall into a pit. A mathematician calculated how he fell into the pit. A news reporter wanted an exclusive story on his pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve the pit. An IRS man asked if he was paying taxes on the pit. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. The Apostle Paul summed it up well when he wrote to the Corinthians. Jesus' purpose in dying for all was that people, while still in life, should cease to live for themselves and should live for him who, for their sake, died and was raised to life. Now, go and do likewise.
standing, let us say together the words of the Nicene Creed, page 7. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people found on page eight. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation, especially the people of Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. For yours is the majesty, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry 
and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, everyone. Welcome to St. Andrews on this, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome anybody who might be worshiping with us for the first time. Glad you're here with us this morning. Also welcome those who are watching at home. I invite everyone to fellowship time after the service over in the parish hall, which can be reached through that door back there on your left and then directly across the courtyard. We're in need of coffee hour hosts for the next four Sundays, so if you want to bring the food for a coffee hour, the sign-up sheet is on the big table there over in the parish hall. Today we welcome Linda Pointer as our guest organist. Linda has substituted many times over the years, so she's no stranger to St. Andrews. We're glad to have you with us today, Linda, and for the next uh, two Sundays as well. Ryan continues his vacation, as does the choir for the month of July. Since it is July, it's time for our outreach activity of the summer, which is Operation Smart Start. And you can read about that on page 18 in the service leaflet. Each year around this time, we're looking for you to bring in backpacks for kids along with uh, a bunch of school items there. And that's all listed on page 18. So if you could do that, that would be great. And this will benefit the kids at Kimball and Cleveland Elementary Schools. So again, page 18, and hopefully you'll help us out with Operation Smart Start. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the plants in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining with your heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. <laughs> So, Father, we have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit. Now bring you before these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and said the blessing broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, I accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your Church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation.
Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever.